So let me go back up to the resources here. So for example, when I play this blood shard, I will gain one little this little blood symbol here. That's the threshold symbol for blood. And you'll notice on each of these ones, you've got a diamond over here. You've got ruby with its little symbol. So each one has its own little symbol. So when we look at that Zentos Inquisitor, we now know that we need to have, you know, we, he requires two of these thresholds. So when you play a resource, you'll gain a threshold, and that's separate from your resources. You'll also notice here you're getting one resource, you know, a temporary resource and a permanent resource. So you're getting, you know, when you play this, you'll have one resource for the turn it's played, but you also that adds to your total resource pool. So if I was to play, let's say I'm playing a mono ruby aggressive deck, you know, we've got some rubies in the deck, uh, and we have, you know, some... Let's actually say we're not Mono Ruby, let's say we're Ruby Diamond, to, to better further the example, uh, the threshold system here. And let's say we've got some, let's say, some Valiant Escorts, which is a very nice aggressive Diamond Troop here. So he's a one-cost Diamond Troop. And then let's just say, for whatever reason, this is not really something that would be done, but let's say we're also running an Anarchist. It's a very nice Ruby aggressive, you know, generally played in Mono Ruby decks. And I'll explain why in a second, but here's your Anarchist. So if we're running a deck with these, right? And uh, we've got the Valiant Escort here, he only requires one, but we've got the Anarchist here that requires two. And let's let's add it to another card as well. We'll use a, uh, a Dead Eye Ripper, why not? He'll do. So, um, you know, he's another one threshold card. So now if, I, if I'm playing Hex and I've just, the game's just started, I play out a, a Diamond on turn one which gives me that one threshold. I, and let's say my hand consists of these guys. I've got these three in my hand and plus a bunch of shards. So what that means is that I've played the diamond, I can therefore play this Valiant Escort. Uh, I cannot play these because I haven't got any ruby threshold yet. It now goes to turn two. I play a ruby. Uh, let's say we've got, uh, you know, these still are in my hand. Let's just pretend our hand is never ending. We always have these in the hand. So we've played out one of them, but now on turn two we've got one ruby and one diamond. So we've got those thresholds, um, they, and they, they are displayed at the bottom of the screen. I'll show that in a in game per, perhaps later, but uh, hopefully this makes sense. Uh, when you do get to play, you'll you'll see what I mean. You'll have that all displayed at the bottom of your screen, um, and your opponents at the top. So we've played the Valiant Escort. Now on turn two, we have the ability to play another Escort. And now let's pretend again that our hand is infinite. So we could now that we've got one of each of these, we could play two Valiant Escorts on turn two because the threshold requirement is met. So as long as that's met, you can use your resources however you like. So you can do two diamond troops, you can do two ruby. Unlike other TCGs where you need to exhaust, you know, your lands, for example, um, you, you you can't actually do things like that. In this case, because of thresholds, you're able to play. You know, once you've got that requirement met, you're able to then do you know two of these in a turn, two of those if you've got the two ruby, you know, one just one ruby, uh, and this guy obviously requiring two. So we play out, you know, maybe on turn three or whatever, we play out another ruby. We can then play this guy as well as one of those, or one of those. Um, that's, yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> I'm probably going a bit overboard here, explaining the thresholds. Um, so let me just catch up on chat here. But yeah, so that's, that's, I mean, obviously it'd be easier for me to show in-game, but uh, hopefully that makes sense there to why the, the threshold system does make it easier to play things. You know, you can play one diamond, one ruby, and therefore you can play one of each of these, or, or you know, two of this on, on turn two even, because the requirement is met, and every shard you play will give you resources. So the resources and thresholds are a separate, separate thing, basically. Uh, so yeah, anyway, so that's the thresholds. Um, what was I going to talk about next? Let me actually check the chat here. If anyone has ch questions in chat, if you're a new player, Feel free to ask. Um, and yes, that is indeed the AA Anarchist. Uh, right, so next up, so we've got thresholds, you know, which is obviously something different now. Obviously, when you're building a deck, uh, you've got something that is also unique to Hex, which is your champions. So we have a lot to choose from, and coming up next week, we're going to have a lot more. Um, these are all the champions you can pick from. They all have a varying amount of health, the starting health. So, for example, a very popular one is Winter Moon here. Which, uh, one thing you'll notice, which I'll go back to actually real quick, is the resources when I showed you them. Let me go back to them here. You'll notice that they, while they're giving that threshold I mentioned, they also gain you a charge. Now, there's a lot of things in the game that give you charges. 
There's also things like resources that don't give you charges because they're they're poopy. Uh, but you know this this one here, for example, gives you two charges but no thresholds. So you know good in and mono mono color decks and all that sort of stuff. But charges are what your champions use, and they give you a little bit of a a boost in power. Uh, and like this, as I said, is a very popular one here. We got Winter Moon, which is a 21 health. Uh, champion, which is for Sapphire Wild. You've still got threshold requirements for the champion power, so you can't just slap it into any deck. You need to actually have those thresholds, which your resources give you. There's also other things that give thresholds as well, but th uh, your resources are the main thing, of course. So this this champion power here, once you've got two charges, so for example, if I played out a Sapphire and then I played a Wild, and then say I put a I played a couple of low cost cards in my my turn. Uh, if there's anything in my crypt, I could then use this power and put those cards back in my deck and they get this new effect, which is when you play it, draw a card, which is a very powerful effect, a very popular champion. Then you've got, you know, all these other champions that all do different things. So you have a lot of ways to change up, you know, you could have the same deck as someone else and then you're like, you know what, I'm going to use this champion instead of, say, this one, because I like to draw cards. In this case, this champion here, it's a blood one, all these ones here are blood. This one here for, for two blood threshold, uh, you, you ch play uh, four charges, you also pay two health as an additional cost for this specific champion power, and it will draw you a card. Whereas the Benushi over here, you know, 18 health champion compared to 21, he's a three cost ch uh, charge power where you can sacrifice a troop, where, and then you can uh, sacrifice one troop and then give another troop plus two plus two. So obviously, you know, this is something, uh, so as I was saying, a deck could be using this one, whereas another player uh, may use this in the same deck, just because they, they feel that, the you know, one player likes to have more cards, the other player might want to just buff up one specific troop, um, or what have you. But there's a, And that adds a lot of depth to your deck building, so this is generally something, the champion may be something you just already decided on as you start to build a deck, but generally you're probably going to look at that afterwards after you've built your deck um and and you know work out okay what what champion actually fits best in my deck um but you you also may have an idea um beforehand but uh you know it depends on <laughs> depends on how uh well you i guess know the game and all that sort of stuff uh, or what you had in mind so when it comes to actually deck building itself uh the the generally the you know again like it's not don't treat it as something as a, a daunting experience. It's very quite simple. Um, you know, so like for example, let's say I wanted to build a deck, and I might be like, you know, maybe I'm new into the game, and I'm like, all right, I'm looking at all these cards. You know, let's say you've got all the cards, um, and you might be like, you know what, I want to build, you know, a very popular card here, as your fate sources. You might look at this and go, oh wow, that's a pretty, that seems very interesting. And uh, you know, it is a very interesting card, and it's in a lot of different decks because the, it has a lot of viability. You can do many different things thanks to the socketable, uh, the two sockets on the card here, which is another unique feature to Hex. Now, sockets, I'll quickly, I'll quickly go over what they are. So let's put this in the deck. Uh, so you've got all these different things to way to customize the card itself. So let's say you're running this. You know, obviously it's a sapphire card, so you have to be running in a sapphire deck. So let's say you're doing mono sapphire. Well, then your options are limited to the the sapphire threshold requirement gems, as every gem has a requirement in terms of thresholds. So if you're playing this in mono sapphire, you've got options of things like quick. Uh, you could give it flight and quick if you like. Now they're two minor gems. You'll notice that oops, keep scrolling too bad. You'll notice that these are minor, but she is able to socket a major and a minor. So you could, for example, then do flying. And you know, one of the popular ones, if you're doing Sapphire, which obviously you're doing Sapphire, but a popular one is Card Draw. Uh, so you might have Flying Card Draw, and that that makes her a, a threat herself, as she can. She's got the evasion factor, um, and then she, when she hits a champion, you'll draw a card. But then obviously her effect here, which is hard to read, I, I know, uh, and as another troop with cost equal to or greater than this troop's cost enters play, uh, she get uh, you know that that troop will then get all socketed powers of this. So if I'm in a Sapphire Wild deck, and I'll, I'll quickly show you uh, the what I've used lately in a deck that obviously was very popular, uh, which was uh, Card Draw and Spell Shield. These two together, it's a very uh, powerful effect. But I'll talk about why and, and all that sort of stuff 
uh, later. But you know, when you're starting off building a deck, you might, that might be your starting point. You might be like, you know what, I really like this troop. Or maybe you're like, ooh, Jankbot. That looks interesting. 150 cards though? Huh, let's see what I can do. So you might, you know, you might see this card, or the alternate art version here. And, you, and that's your starting point. That's that's a good way to go about to getting started to deck building, because from there, you know, you've got that that first card that you look at and you're like, "Ooh, I really love this card. I wanna I wanna build something." You know, for example, you might see, you know, maybe you're a fan of bunnies. So then you're like, "Oh wow, a flying rabbit! Hell's yeah! I wanna build a deck with this guy." So I wanna I wanna now, you know, build a deck that will utilize it to its strengths and also other cards to complement it and all that sort of stuff um, so yeah that's a you know flying rabbit for example so I'm gonna go back in time now because I'm a time traveler of course and we're gonna go back and look at a deck that was very popular back in set 2 a deck that I made uh, where did I where is it so I'm gonna go back to mono sapphire here good old mono sapphire days hey what's what's the question here <laughs> 23 a astrophe a's I rolled a lot of them I spun a lot of chance, but I mean, I also, I think I bought some, I don't know. But uh, yeah, so here's a deck that I made a very long time ago, back in set two. Yeah, Yazi's a lot richer than me, <laughs> at least I think he is. Anyway, so, um, this, again, so here's a deck that I built back, you know, back in set two, so it was a very long time ago, and I'm going to show you basically where I started from, and uh, all that sort of stuff, so, you know, here's the deck itself, Champion. And see, the champion is something that probably came. You know, I can't remember exactly my my all my thoughts back then when I when I first made the deck, but uh, I probably very much decided on Bertram from the get go because I knew I wanted to make a deck with Reese. Now here's Reese. He's the Mister Crustcrawler here, very powerful card with a random effect. Now he's a tunneling troop, which was something that was introduced back in set two. And, uh, you know, very powerful effect. And you'll, you'll see him still being played in, in today's meta and probably in the future meta as well. But uh, So basically the, what, what he does is he tunnels for four turns, which is quite a long time. So and you, so if you're lucky, you're tunneling him... on Because it costs two to tunnel a card, so I'll briefly explain that. You can read this here. But you'll notice here it says basic two tunnel, reach the cross call. Now every tunneling troop is cost does cost two. So the earliest you can tunnel something is on turn two. And if you can do this guy on turn 2, uh, well then he'll pop out on turn 6, and uh, at the end of your turn, he creates a worker bot and puts him into play. But it also says here, when he surfaces, he gets, if one of your cards or effects would create a worker bot, which is what he does, then you create a random robot instead. So, you know, back, like as I said, back when I started building this deck, I was like, alright, I want to make something that utilizes this, and we want to take advantage of his power. So, you know, that was my starting point. So then it's like, all right, we've got this. He's going to make random robots. Now it's a random effect. So what's the best way to utilize that? So one of the, you know, and again, it's obviously something you have to consider when deck building is the matter as well. You know, is is my, is this is what I'm doing viable? But you know, obviously that's where testing and all that can come into it. But you know, feel free to have fun. You don't have to always be thinking about, you know, constructed and all that sort of stuff. So you know, again, this is this is the starting point. And I want to now make use of these robots. I want to make them better. So, you know, I, again, I don't remember how exactly I went about building the deck, but uh, Menacing Growl was one of the cards that I probably added in quite early, as the meta was quite troop-focused back then. But uh, it also does work very nicely with those random robots, because no matter how big or small they are, you're still going to be able to push in... Because, uh, for example, with the, the charge power here, which I didn't show you, I guess, but it creates a random worker bot. So the whole idea, uh, the whole starting point for the deck, you know, without even considering all the rest of the stuff it can do, we already have the potential to play this on, you know, tunnel it on turn two, he pops out later, you then get a free robot, you know, you don't know how big or small it's going to be, and then at the end of turn, you know, as it says here, he creates another worker bot, so another random robot. So you're getting two robots instantly. So then, if he sticks around, which remember, he was tunneled and then he pops out of the ground, you've still got your resources available. So obviously the, the first place to go from there is to have things like counter magic, which is just interrupt a target card, and then also Verdict of the Ancient King. So these are two cards that can be used to protect something like that, because when he untunnels you'll have your resources for the turn fully renewed, and you'll be, have cards ready to protect him. So that was, you know, a no-brainer. 
So they, they go in the deck. So they, they were like, you know, auto-include pretty much uh, to, ha to have that protection from when he untunnels. But then I wanted a way to uh, abuse the fact that, you know, we've got these free robots now, but we don't know how big or small they're going to be. But we want to make sure we can push through a lot of damage and potentially just finish our opponent off with potentially, you know, a combo. So Grelk is a good one in the fact that when it enters play, you exhaust each opposing troop and those troops can't ready during their controller's next step. So that's basically two turns of swings you get, uh, potentially unhindered. And uh, so that's obviously nice, because you're going to get those two robots. Let's say you get a three, a three damage troop and a two damage troop. Well, then you've got four damage from Reese himself, and then an extra, what did I say? So you'll have nine damage on the board. So let's say Reese gets to hit him, or maybe you can't because they've got things on the board, or you're scared. You know, back in, back in that meta, there was things like Repel, that was widely used, which I'll quickly show that here. So maybe you don't get that four damage in. Maybe your opponent's tapped out. Maybe you do. Uh, whoops. Let me actually show one where you can read it. So let's just destroy, destroy a target attacking troop. But let's say he untunnels. You decide to just protect him with you know leaving up counter. Your opponent tries to kill it or something. You protect it. Then next turn, um, you know your opponent's got troops on the board, so you want to get through. You've got that nine damage. You can play out the menacing Grog, hit in for nine. And then, um, uh, th and then your know, next, you know, depending on what your opponent does, then you maybe you get to hit in for nine or more. Because remember, Reese is going to make another robot, and you'll have the Grauk as well now. So now you've got even more damage. So from that alone, you've got that potential to just kill very easily with just those few interactions there. Um, and then obviously we've got another card here, which was something I included very quickly into the deck because, um, you know, it works very well with Reese, the crosscaller. Now, remember I said he untunnels on turn six. So what's better than getting him out sooner when your opponent's not ready for it? So Mastery of Time, you can cast this on five. And if your opponent has, for example, maybe they've just, they're like, oh, it's, you know, I know it's Reese because, you know, the matter and all that, they're thinking about it. They're like, okay, it's very likely Reese. I'm against Mono Sapphire. You know, it's, it's at, um... Uh, you know, they're, they're not expecting it to untunnel yet, so they play something, then on your turn you do Mastery of Time, so then Reese comes out basically on your turn 5, because all you're doing with Mastery of Time is taking another turn, so it's kind of like saying, alright, don't worry about my turn 5, let's go straight to, to 6, because you're going to get that, um, you know, you're, you're basically getting that counter, you know, by, by doing that, so, you know, because he gets a counter, obviously, every every turn you get that tunneling there. So there, if you want to pause right now and uh, read what that says, if you're not familiar with tunneling, you can. Uh, but yeah, so each each turn, you know, I guess that's something I didn't mention, but each turn it's underground, you get a tunneling counter. When it reaches that number here, which is four, that's when it untunnels, hence the reason he pops out on six. So again, you know, so Mastery of Time allows you to, to cast it the turn before. He's going to pop out and make him come out when they're not ready. So that's a nice uh, combo there. But also... Say you're not doing it on turn 5 because you've got something else you're doing. Maybe you're putting down a, a Dreamer or you're just leaving up counters or whatever it may be. Uh, and then you do it after Reese uh, untunnels and your opponent doesn't have answers for him. Well, that means you get you know additional robots, even more. And then if you then do a Grauk after that, after you've got the heaps of robots, well then again, there's all that synergy combining together to make Reese a very powerful force. So these, these three cards here combining together are already very nice. So we've got that there, and obviously we've got the protection cards. So it's like, alright, we don't have actually many win conditions in the deck. It's very reliant on Reese at this point, right? Because uh, without Reese, we're not really, you know, that's all we're, we're doing at the moment, or what we're talking about. So then we want to have another threat, another thing that is potentially a must-answer card. And that's where Elder's Dreamer came in. So he's a 4-drop, and that's a key point here, is he's a 4-drop. Um, and, he, you know, we can give him his unblockable troops, so that's, you know... In the meta as it was, you know, he's three damage, can't be blocked, and we can give him this major major gem. So giving him card draw was a big deal because you could chuck him out on four, and you don't even, you know, if you've got Reese Underground, you don't even care if they kill it. But if they don't, well then that's fantastic, because then you've got the synergy now with Mastery of Time. So let's say we had Reese Underground on two, turn three, we leave up a counter, we do maybe, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the peak and stuff later, but let's say we do a Buccaneer on three which is just a troop to tempo your opponent. Uh, you know, it gets to... You get to put something on the board while putting something over your opponent's back in their hand, increasing the cost, so it's a tempo card. Um, 
But yeah, and then on four, maybe you play out the Dreamer. So at this point, you've got one real threat on the, the board, which is the Dreamer. Uh, you've got Reese Underground. And then on the next turn, you know, you've got that synergy again. You Mastery of Time. You get a card with a Dreamer, knowing that you can do it again. So you get in three damage, another three damage, and you've drawn two cards. Reese is untunneled. And, you know, they've got all that synergy now. And also, again, because it's a, a threat that your opponent is not going to want to leave a, around on the board, they don't want you getting card advantage. Just card advantage pretty much is king when it comes to, you know, to winning games. Cards, uh, you know, the more options you have, the better you're probably going to do. So, uh, you know, this is something that you're making your opponent either answer or you're just going to keep getting ahead. And then you've got that, you know, again, these are working together, these cards. So we've got all these now working together. Uh, you got these and this and this working very really nicely together, but also the fact that if your opponent kills this, well then they might not have the answer for this when he does untunnel. Uh, but yeah, all these three here work together very nicely. Obviously again, the protection. So if you're, for example, you do play this out, your opponent's turn, they just play out a threat of their own, um, and then you attack in with this, maybe your mastery of time, and you know, you've got a lot of ways to, to really just get really ahead right there. Um, so then, you know, that, that's the, you know, the late game of the deck. That's, that's the win conditions, right? You've got the Dreamer and the Reese as your main sources, you know, your source of advantage here, your main win condition with Reese. And then just to, to make sure you can get through is the, the Grout, and that utilizes with the robots. Again, this was, you know, based on the matter back then. So then it was again, so the early game was all about uh, the tempo. You've got the Buccaneer here to, to just slow your opponent down while you're waiting for your Reese to to, you know, you want to make sure you're not dying, of course. And that's where the charge power was also somewhat decent. You could, if you really needed to, bring that out as a chump blocker if you're against an aggressive deck. Uh, but the Buccaneer to tempo your opponent. And then you've got, uh, Peak is just basically a card to, you know, very, very good card in Mono Sapphire. If you're running a Mono Sapphire deck, you should always look at this card and try and get it in your deck if you can, as it's very powerful. Um, it's quick action, so you can do it on your opponent's turn while you're leaving open counter magic and things like that. Uh, but you can look at the top card of your deck equal to the number of sapphire thresholds you have. So if you've got five, five, you know, threshold, then you can look at five cards and grab what's needed. So you might want to grab your mastery of time and do that on turn five. Um, you know, say, say for example, you've left this open on four with the counter magic. Your opponent doesn't play anything you need to counter. Um, you then use the peak at the end of turn, grab a Mastery of Time, cast it, and then off you go with your with your combo there, with your cards that are you know synergizing very nicely together. So peak is a, obviously a very nice card in a in a mono sapphire deck. Um, but yeah, so then the early game stuff we had over here is Cerulean Maronite is just a, another card that uh, you can put out early if you don't have you know Reese or maybe you do. You're always going to want a tunnel Reese on two if if you've got him. But uh, Mirror Knight is something you could do on three. Again, if you're against a, a slow deck when you don't need a Buccaneer or something, you could put this down, and then maybe you play the Buccaneer the turn after, or maybe it's a, or you know, so maybe you play this on three, Buccaneer or Dreamer on four, and then they're going to get that nice Inspire effect for when it dies, you draw a card. So just making sure you're going to stay in the game, provided, provided things go south, you've got multiple ways to draw more cards. So this is something you can play on, you know, two, two or three, depending on your hand. And then we've also got Storm Cloud, which is a card that definitely has fell out of favor at the moment. Uh, and there are several reasons for that, but I'm not going to go into it. But uh, it's still a very good card, and I expect it to come back in the future. But it's uh, you know it's an interesting card that utilizes the those uh, charge charges we talked about. So charges aren't just for your champion. There's also cards that utilize them. So in this case, uh, we've got this little happy cloud. And as you can see here, he's a flying 0-2, so he doesn't really do anything by himself, but he eats up charges. And as you can see here, it says, when you gain a charge, add a storm counter to this. And then at basic speed, you can remove all storm counters and, and then sacrifice it. And then what it will do is it create a random stormling for each storm counter. So let's say we played this out on, you know, maybe we do this on turn 2, this on turn 3, and then we play as Crackling Vortex to gain two more charges. And then we could, if we wanted to, then sacrifice this and gain two little Stormlings. Now, I don't know if I can... I guess I can't really show what they are, but there's a there's three different variants of Stormlings. Um, and they all do different things. One of them you can sacrifice. It's all, They're all 1-1s. One, 1-1 ones, one, one flyers. And the one of them you can sacrifice to draw a card. So very nice. Another one you can sacrifice to exhaust an opposing troop. 
um, and another one you can sacrifice to uh, deal two damage to it to an exhausted troop so you've got some interesting things there uh, you can use them as chump blockers and the cool thing about the stormlings is they don't have the basic requirements so you can chump block with for example the one that draws a card and then sacrifice it in response so you won't take any damage if it's a life drain troop they're not going to get that life drain because you've sacrificed the the stormling you'll draw a card and if of course you had the mirror knight in play all those three stormlings you may or two stormlings in this case if you play a vortex after the cloud they will both also get inspired by the mirror knight so you get some synergies there and that's some the, the early game of the deck basically so you know you've got potential for even more card advantage and also ways to make sure you're not just dying uh, as you've got potentially uh, you know chump blockers or you know more card advantage all that sort of stuff from the little stormlings so they were they were that was a big part of the deck so that you know again that was a deck that was that I built back in set 2 and holy crap I should probably breathe right <laughs> so yeah i mean that's a, again that's a deck that I built back in set 2 and it all started with, you know, Reese, and I wanted to utilize that card. So, you know, again, we've got those very nice, uh, you know, synergies here with how they all work together. Um, you know, the Grout with the Reese, the Ma the Dreamer with the Mastery, and the Mastery with Dreamer, you know, a well, Mastery with Dreamer and Reese, obviously working very nicely. And then you've got the early game stuff to make sure you can get, to, you know, you can survive long enough for those things to come online to do what they're designed to do. So that was that deck, you know, so and then from there, um, you know, I spawned off from just from this, from this initial idea, it spawned up, up a two different creations that then turned into many more things. Um, <laughs> what are you saying here? It's nice to see you finally reaching out for help, Henrik, yeah. Nice, nice one, Malikus. Always with the uh, good comments there. <laughs> so uh, let me just have a drink of water real quick. So again, so when you're wanting to build a deck, you know, find that starting point. In this case, it was Reese, and from there, you know, we, we utilized various things to, to, to make a really nice deck there, and it it did very well in the meta for, I want to say, like four months or something, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it was a very nice deck, and many people won with it. It was pretty sweet. Um, the reason it fell off, though, was set three, uh, you know, really changed the meta, as all sets will. You know, we got set four coming next week. And that's going to change the meta once again. But one of the biggest factors in this deck, you know, one of the bigger cards that, you know, stop this. I mean, the deck's still quite good. You can still run it in the current meta, but there, the, because of the stuff we got in the in, in, in set three, there's kind of not really a reason to do mono sapphire, as you can do more powerful things by combining it with other uh, with other shards. And Crocosaur was a big one of those things. To, uh, to really, you know, hurt the deck. Hurt lots of decks, technically. But, uh, again, so from this deck, you know, it, it then spawned other decks. So I'll quickly show, you know, I, a deck that I started running towards the end of set 2, which was basically a variant of that deck designed to beat it, to have an advantage over it anyway. Uh, which was, if I can find the damn thing. Old Wild Sapphire, there we go. So you can see here, that we've got, uh, you know, we've, we've now we've still got some of those key cards, but obviously some of them are removed, um, and uh, some other ones in their place. So uh, this, I don't know if it's the exact. I mean, I, I I went and had a a look at my old videos and stuff, and I think this is pretty much what I was running. If I was to build it again now, even with just set two, I'd probably do things differently, because uh, you know, obviously experience will will uh, you know help you with deck building basically just you know, the more experience you have the better you'll get uh, but this was a this was a version of you know basically taking the mono sapphire list and making it so it has the basically the advantage against it um, and the reason the ways we could do that because we, we basically take advantage of the weaknesses to mono sapphire which is its lack of removal so you know not you know it has you know buccaneer for example which this deck is still using but Buccaneer is one of those, you know, it's just it's just a card that delays your opponent. It's not actually removing it permanently, it's just temporary removal. So this is a deck that was designed to to take advantage of the weaknesses and give it a leg up. And one of the main things that did that was Side of the Sun. As it's a card, it's a troop that you can put down early, and if it isn't removed, 
then you can go bananas with it. <laughs> so I'll explain why. Uh, you know, it's a three cost one two that you can exhaust to replenish all your resource points. You gain health for the resources gained this way. And yeah, so basically, let's let's just give you an example of what that means. So you play this out on turn three. Turn four comes along, and then you're like, all right, let's play out. You know, we'll use the example of a troop that was still in Mono Sapphire. Still in this deck, you know, well, you play out the Oldjish Dreamer, which is that card that gets us advantage. Every turn it hits in, we're getting in three damage. We're also drawing cards. So beautiful. And, uh, you know, great. So we play out this. We then play out this. Now we've got this guy. He's not sick anymore. He's not, you know, he doesn't have a. What would you call it in, in Hex? I don't know. But he's not. Um, you know, it's, I guess in most TCGs they call it summoning sickness. You know, obviously when you play it, you can't use this effect straight away. But on, on the next turn, you can use it. So we'll play out this on three. Play out the Dulgeth Dreamer. And then we can exhaust this guy. And we have a, a few options, depending on obviously our hand. But with the way the deck is designed, the whole objective was to play out your threat and then potentially protect it. So you can then leave up your counter magic. Um, and then uh, troop trauma. Okay, fair enough. So you can then protect it. So you've played out this really good threat. You've already got a very nice thing healing you. and you know, So you could play that out and protect it. Now let's say you don't have this in your hand. What you could do is potentially play out another threat. So you could play out two threats in the one turn. And if you're against, you know, for example, if I was against Mono Sapphire, there's really no way for that deck to really punish you because, again, it's the main answer it has for the early game is Buccaneer. So they might be able to bounce one of your threats, but then the next turn comes along and you can just keep doing it again. Like You can play out a, a Renlock, which is another good card, that, you know, if it goes unanswered, you're going to get ahead because every time you play an action, you draw a card. So the whole the whole way this took advantage of Mono Sapphire was mainly through Side of the Sun. And as you can see, we're splashing wild just for that, you know? Now one, I, and one thing you'll notice here is we've got Azure Fate, which, you know, you can do many... Again, you've got those, those options there for the gems. But uh, I also... Because one thing I've got to mention, I guess, is that you can only use four of a gem. So I can't just go put, you know, I can't put like 20 socketable troops in my deck and give everything, you know, all those socketable troops card draw. I can't do that. You can only do a maximum of four. It's the same limitation as you can with cards. So you can't, you know, I guess that's something I forgot to mention as well. If you are new to card games, that's something you might not know, is, uh, you know, in most of them, and hex is, uh, you know, the same, you're using four of any given card, maximum. Uh, now that doesn't apply to limited, however, so go nuts in limited. Um, you can run as many as you pick, uh, but in constructed you can do a maximum of four, and that's why you're seeing me not running any more of four of a card. Uh, but again, so again, this this is basically you know taking that mono sapphire list and saying, all right, what can we do to give myself an advantage over it now that everyone's using it? And that's where you know side of the sun was just a no-brainer, as it allows you to put down a threat, potentially protect it, and lock your opponent out of the game from doing anything of importance. You can be like, you know what, you're playing your own threat, I'm going to counter that. Then your turn comes along again. Maybe you play an Oracle Song, which is draw two cards. And then you maybe just get another counter, so you leave that open by exhausting this guy again. Um, yeah, the, the, exactly. Malicious there, Malicious Demise uh, does bring up a good point. The four of gems does apply to limited, but the card amount... So you could, you, if, you, if you were to draft, you know, this is a set one card. If you were drafting set one and you... You know, I, I, I remember back in the day... Drafting a, you know, a bunch of Buccaneers. And you're able to run as many as you get. So if you drafted like eight of them, you could run all eight. And it's, uh, it was definitely really nasty to do stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so and that's one of the things that makes Limited very fun. Is you can do things you can't do in Constructed. Like run, you know, four Buccan uh, eight Buccaneers or what have you. It'll be interesting to see what set four gives us in that regard. Um, but yeah, so again, this is, you know, the deck. You can, you can see that I took out Stormcloud. Um, took out, uh, you know, one Mirror Knight. Um, yeah, I've got some, got a different ca a card here, Zodiac Divination, which is more card draw. It works very well with the Side of the Sun. As again, this, this card just enables you to do crazy stuff where you can play, you can get really, uh, you can just do so much in one turn because you're basically got double your resources and you're healing to boot. So if this is something that doesn't get answered, you can play out, you know, a Renlock, leave up, counter magic or if it's like turn five you play out a renlock and then mastery of time you've just drawn a card 
and you know you're gonna have another turn and uh, this, the amount of ways you know it's a, it's a lot of ways and that alone was something that made the deck able to have the advantage over mono sapphire but by adding in these additional threats threats that have to be answered because if they don't you're very likely going to get further ahead with card advantage which again card advantage is pretty much king um, so you know again so dreamer renlock azure fate all these here are four drops that I could play after playing this um, that I can put down and if my opponent doesn't answer them I'm gonna get card advantage uh, and then you've obviously still got Reese in the deck as just a three of it now as um, just yeah w whatever reason you know it's Reese is one of those things that it's a very good card but if you're not getting it down to, you know tunneling it on say turn two or three it's not really something you'll want to see and this deck does again because it has a lot more early threats didn't feel the need to have four of him, as you don't want to have, you know, you don't want to draw multiple. It's it's a unique card, which again, that's something I haven't forgot to mention as well. So you'll notice this card here is unique, and that is something you will have to take into account when deck building. So uh, unique basically means that if it's unique, each player can only have one of that card in play, as it says there in the little tooltip. So I can't, you know, just tunnel a Reese and tunnel another one because that also applies to tunnelers you can't have two of them underground you can't have one tunneling and one in play as it tunneling kind of it's not in play but it counts when this in this restriction so if I was to tunnel a Reese and then later play one while it was still on the ground uh, the one that was underground would then just go straight to the crypt and die so not recommended uh, but also like here for example the side of the Sun while unique card so I can only ever play one of this the reason why this deck ran four and, uh, you know, because, again, it's very powerful. If it goes unanswered, then you can just go absolutely mental, um, you know, be because of the fact that you can play threats. You know, being a, being in a Sapphire dominant, dominant deck, you can play a threat and then protect it with your counters, which obviously Sapphire is very well known for. Um, so, yeah, you've got... Uh, let me just quickly adjust something there. So yeah, you've got uh, this guy is unique. You know, the, yes, you can have some clunky hands where you draw too many of them, but the fact that it is something that is must answer in most cases, unless you've just got a really bad hand, but your opponent's not going to know that unless they're playing cards to look at your hand. Uh, they're going to have to, you know, they're going to be in most cases like, oh, I need to kill this and I need to kill it fast. So if they kill it and you do have another one, that's fine. You just play it out. And again, they're in that position of, oh, if I don't kill that, maybe my opponent then does more than I can handle. You know, like, say, for example, I played this out on three, my opponent then kills it, I then play it out on four, and then my opponent leaves it alone. Now they're like, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to let you have it. And then I was to play, like, a Dreamer, and a Master... Uh, no, no, not a Dreamer. Uh, yeah, if I was to play, like, um, a Dreamer, and my opponent's, like, tapped out after the next turn, I could then probably do Dreamer and Master in the same turn. And that's... Then, you know, basically I'm going to get guaranteed card advantage, and, yeah... But uh, one thing, you know, if I was to make this deck now, there's a card that Sent3 introduced that, you know, well, I guess I, I kind of did make this deck again. I, I went back to it. Let's let's actually bring that up here. I went back to that sort of design um, not long back now, um, which you would have seen if you checked out my YouTube and you've seen Monday Men of Madness. Episode 1 actually covered this deck here. Well, you'll notice has some of those key cards in there. Obviously, there's also some very different things. For example, not using Reese, as I didn't feel the need to. I did try it with Reese initially. But, uh, you know, again, that, that thing I mentioned about Reese is that if you're not getting him underground on turn two or three, you're not really going to want to draw him in the late game. So we're still using, you know, again, this is a set three deck here. In the, you know, in the current meta, still being played. Um, using Side of the Sun again. We're now using four Azure Fates, though, with Spell Shield. A Spell Shield has always been strong and probably always will be for quite some time. Uh, but using Spell Shield and Card Draw. And then one thing we did with what I did with this deck is to I wanted to make utilize the the Azure Fate here and give it uh, a high chance of being a threat by itself because a two two is easily blocked. And so you know a card that I don't I'm not a huge fan of is Time Ripple. So I'm not a fan of this card and I try to avoid using it as much as I can. But in this deck, I found a way to, to basically utilize its power uh, and then get, you know, basically get back a card. So I can, you know, with Chlorophyllia here, you know, this is something I could have done back in set two, this, this, this synergy here, these combos, is by utilizing Time Ripple, 
you can you know play this out say on turn three if you're lucky if you've done this on two uh, which gives you a, a shard from your deck uh, you could then get this down on three maybe you get it down on four if your opponent only has one blocker then you can use something like this which you know time ripple puts a controller's uh, um, card uh, a target card into its controller's hand and also increases the cost so that's a cheap action so you know that and that they work together so you can play her out and because she's got that that card draw when she deals damage to a champion they work very nicely together um, so yeah and then again so that's you know that's that's kind of you know got some of the same things but again so set three introduced uh, you know this this card here very nice um, wind singer just took over the meta in terms of what what you should be running in if you're running wild sapphire this card here is just bonkers insane you might think well at six cost that's pretty expensive but uh, you know you've got chlorophyllies to help you get there you've got arcane focus one of the best you know one cost sapphire cards in the game just in just the value uh, and then you that champion I mentioned earlier winter moon here so you've got these early cost uh, early cards that you can use get more thresholds if you need them or get what you need and then put those back in your deck to just be you know to just go mental when it comes to late game but so that's you know not going to really go over the deck obviously if you want to if you want to really find out how the that deck operates all the intricate details and all that stuff including the reserves check out uh, episode one of monday meta madness um so let's go back so then also let's go back to the mono sapphire here so again so that's you know this is what started it all you know this was the first one i made um, back in you know back in set two, it was probably the first, the first good deck I made really. <laughs> you know, I made other decks before, but this is where it really took off. Um, so that this was the starting point for several other decks that I made. Um, and yeah, so I talked about that, and then uh, so then I did the the wild sapphire variant, which was designed to to take advantage of what the weaknesses were for mono sapphire, and then I also made a a ruby sapphire variant that was designed to um, be more about tunneling and stuff and get around certain cards. I never did run it back in set 2, I don't think. Maybe like just casually and stuff. Uh, I remember showing it to people on stream and whatnot. But I basically, you know, took again that deck and went to the Ruby Sapphire variant. Uh, if I can damn well find it. There we go. So again, you know, went with the Azure Fate here, but this time it was, it was, you know, again, all about Reese. You know, that was again still the starting point. The thing I liked. You know, was you know, I'm a huge fan of Sapphire. In case you can't tell, um, so that you know, I wanted to, um, you know, I was running various different decks back then, back in those days, uh, but it was generally Sapphire something. And the whole reason I made Sapphire, just mono Sapphire, was because I was actually sick of getting screwed by thresholds. <laughs> so I was like, you know what, I'm going to go for consistency. So I went for mono Sapphire. It worked out really nice. Uh, but then I still, you know, still liked the other things that was possible. You know, you. By, by doing another color, you can do things that that color is weak at. In this case, we've got some actual removal in this deck. We've got a two cost, deal three damage to target champion or troop and gain a charge. So that's a, Crackling Bolt is a very nice card in the fact that, you know, you can use it to kill a troop or if you just need to finish off your opponent, you can do so. So this here again, you know, I took that, that, uh, that Mono Sapphire list and said, all right, what, what can I do now? You know, what can I do differently? Or, or better if I now go with Ruby as my secondary color. So we've saw the the wild sapphire sapphire variant where I, I basically just took side of the sun and then th thought of extra ways to abuse side of the sun. So I added in more four drops, more things I could do for the turn after to really give me more threats while protecting them and lock my opponent out of the game. So that was that strategy of that of that one. Whereas mono sapphire strategy was to delay long enough. To then combo off with Grauk and Reese, you know, or Ma and Mastery of Time, all that sort of stuff. So that was that strategy, and then this strategy turned it a bit differently, uh, changed it, changed it basically of the idea. So we still had the card advantage cards, with you know we still have Mirror Knight in there, which you know again every troop you play that is two cost or higher will get this nice effect here for when it dies draw a card. So we've still got that. We've still got you know in this one we've got Time Ripple which is another tempo card. We've got the bolt now, so we've got some removal and extra damage to the face if needed. But then we also added in Mentalist, which is a Inspire troop as well, similar to the Mirror Knight. 
and this one reads, you know, Inspire is all the same. It's all to do with the cost of the troop itself. So in this case, you know, any troop that's three or higher will get this effect, which is when this deals damage to an opposing champion, draw a card. And uh, the reason why, you know, because we're now in Ruby, we had access to, to some new gems. So, you know, before we were using in Mono Sapphire, it was, uh, well, this wasn't actually used in Mono Sapphire because the gems were lackluster. You know, you could do, for example, card draw and, you know, flight, which would be okay as an alternative to the, the Dreamer. But the, the reason why Dreamer was in there over something like Azure Fate is because Dreamer is unblockable. So it's guaranteed to get you that card if it's not getting answered. So you get that guaranteed card. So that's why if you were to use this in Mono Sapphire with that same gem, the card draw, and Flight, for example, to give the evasion, she can still be blocked by flyers. So that's, you know, and that's the difference there. But this, this deck, now that we've got access to Ruby, we have access to some new gems. So, for example, we've now got access to the Major Ruby of Destruction. So when it enters play, it deals damage to its damage to target opposing champion. So in this case, she's only got two damage. Not a big deal. That's not much damage. But that's where we can synergize, and that's why the Mentalist comes in. So the Mentalist now, again, it reads, when this deals damage to opposing champion, draw a card. So that's that effect there, it doesn't have it itself. It's giving it to troops that are three cost or higher. So we could play this out on turn three. And then the Azure Fate, you'll notice that the Sapphire Gem she's using, I know it's very hard to read, but the Sapphire Gem she is reading is Quick. Now what that means, I'll just quickly show you that Quick in all zones basically means if you've got two Sapphire, you can be, you know, your opponent's, it's on your opponent's turn, you're holding open counter magic, your opponent doesn't do anything of importance, like nothing that threatens you too badly, you don't need to answer it. So then at the end of their turn, because she is Quick, meaning you can do it pretty much any time you've got uh, priority. You can then play her out at the end of your opponent's turn. She'll do her damage. If you've got this in play, it will then get inspired. So then she'll give you a card just by playing her. So she automatically replaces herself. So you've got that synergy. And, uh, you know, the main, the main thing I liked about this as well is because, you know, again, we wanted to do stuff with Reese that makes him bonkers. And the main, you know, there's a video actually from ages ago um, where I showed off the combo specifically with some pretty nutty draws, where basically, you know, tunneling turn to Reese, and remember, he's going to make some random robots. Back in these days, you know, it was, I was still doing Bertram, which then got later turned into, uh, you know, a different champion actually got uh, popular with the deck. This is something I didn't actually consider myself, which is, uh, you know, again, you know, one player might do one thing and another player goes, you know what, let's look at the champions. <laughs> so Tetsar is an interesting champion with what we've just showed you in the fact that for six charges you can reveal the top ten cards of your deck and create a rock elemental. And it gets plus one plus one for each resource revealed this way. So for example, if you were to use this, which is something that the deck pretty much, you know, this, this list here is, as, as I said, my old list which then later evolved and people took and changed and did their own thing too. Um, you know, Tensot was one of the big changes because you can, if you're lucky, you can get, you know, on average you might get like a 4-4 four four or something or a 3-3, three three, which is not not great, but, you know, you can also get the, you know, like I did in, in a tournament where I got a 7-7 seven seven and won the game because it synergizes, as it's a 6-cost troop, it synergizes with the Azure Fate Sorceress, so she'll now give her gems to the, the the rock elemental that we've just created. So if you do, in the case like I did in, in a tournament, I created a 7-7 seven, seven rock elemental with her in play, so then that's just instant 7 damage to the face. Now, in this case, in the tournament, I actually had two Azure Fates, and they stack. So I got two then sources of 7 damage to the face. So I didn't even have to swing. Bang, 14 damage, I won the game. It was, it was pretty damn amazing. You know, this, again, she's very powerful. And, uh, you know, the, the power of the gems there, of, you know, the flexibility, you know, where every time you go to, you know, in this case, we're going with the splashing of the ruby, it opened up a new gem, which then opened up a whole new strategy of winning, which didn't even require you to attack. So that was, you know, and that's one of the, you know, really good things about, you know, splashing colors, obviously. You start with, you know, as I said, I started with Mono Sapphire, you know, it did really well for a while, and then, you know, more cards get released, and it's like, alright, what can we do if we um, splash in, you know, for example, I splashed in Wild for Side of the Sun, 
gave it a leg up in the mirror in the, in a match. You know, if you're against Mono Sapphire, then this deck didn't really get popular till Set Three. I can't remember who it was who first took my deck and they changed it a bit, added some you know cards in from Set Three, like Duplicious Duke. Obviously, Arcane Focus being a very good Sapphire card. Um, but yeah, so you know, took took full advantage. It takes full advantage of the the new gem we opened up there. And you don't even need to attack. So then we also took into account the fact that we've got her, we've got you know counter magics to protect. Uh, you know, you got things like Verdict you can be running as well. Um, you still got some dreamers, but again, this this is an old old list. Um, yeah, if I was to make it again, you know, my my the last version I ran, you know, again it was based on the meta, it had like burns in there, so extra early removal. Um, I'll quickly show burn. I mean most people will be familiar with burn. But it's just a one cost deal two damage to target champion or troop. So um, I wonder if I still actually have it built. But yeah, you'll you'll notice that I still got mastery of time in there because um, again, it still does work great with tunnelers. But you know the main synergy behind the main win condition behind this version now, as opposed to Mono Sapphire, was the fact that we can just play her out at any point because of that quick thing, get some damage in, synergizes with this. Um, and then with these other tunnelers, we've got this one here, which is a 5 damage on the front end. Also with a very powerful effect of its own. So when these all popping out, you know, this is another tunneler here. 3 damage on the front end, you also get to look at your opponent's hand. Um, you've got these things that you can... They, they're all they're all over 4 costs, so they all get inspired. So the, the win condition behind it was, you know, you, you could potentially get card advantage just by them untunneling and entering play. They also ping your opponent in the face for you know five damage, four damage, three damage. But the the main thing I liked about it, and the main thing I wanted to do was with Reese, which I think back in those days I probably still ran four Reese in this version because it is a very powerful combo. You could, for example, play her at quick speed at your end of your opponent's turn, uh, just before Reese is about to untunnel. He pops out, does four damage. You've got your counters open. Then, in, in the case of the version where I still ran worker bots, uh, the, the charge power, I could create a worker bot, get a random robot, and let's say I'm lucky and I get a robot like, a, let's say I get a jank bot, or let's say I get even luckier and I get a mega hulk, which is a robot, which is a 10-10. So if you get that, you've got an Azure Fate that did 2 damage, a Reese that did 4, you create a random robot, and then if it's this, which, you know, it has happened, uh, that's 10 damage just from creating it, and then at the end of turn, he creates another random robot. You can just win, and that's it. That's all. You didn't even didn't even attack. All you did was play the mat. So that was you know that started a whole you know that's a, a deck that um, I guess me and Tino popularized even further back in the in the qualifiers. And Tino, or I should say Vazriel, ended up qualifying, and and then he used the deck again at the Invitational recently. So if you saw that, you'll know you'll see his version. He he added some, obviously, his own changes again. Uh, but this, again, this is a set 2 version. Um, I'll have a quick look. I don't think I have the set 3 version still built. I might. Actually, I probably... Let's what's, what's this one. So, yeah, here we go. So, it's missing four, six cards. Uh, six cards. What is it? Okay, so Reese. So this is basically the version I ran in set 3. And this is actually probably what I was running... Uh, when it was the qualifier, with the invitation of qualifiers, uh, missing a bolt, and the reason why, you know, for example, I've got burn in there, uh, as in the matter at the time, there was a lot of low cost, low low health and low cost troops that are like must answer. The main ones were things like puck. Uh, puck was a very prevalent card in the matter. You can notice it's got two health. It also comes down on turn two. It's it's a must answer troop. It still is to this day. Um, so that's why I ran four burn, but also Periwinkle, which is in the same deck, um, ran. You know, this is another must answer thing as well. Um, and then also Azure Fate, you know, being as popular as she was, which actually that's what's missing. And wait, where is she in this deck list? <laughs> I guess yeah. You know, okay, so that's that's that was uh, that one, and I guess Master had yeah, inside. So that's probably about right there. So, you know, and this, again, so based on the meta, this this deck, you know, this is how I've been running it up until I last ran it, basically. Pretty much this here. Um, and again, so Tetsot was the change, because you get that, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a more, 
Like, honestly, you could still do Bertram, but then, obviously, if you don't get Reese, the Bertram does just a 1-1. One, one. So that's, you know, that's the downside of doing Bertram, is if you don't get Reese. And that is also one of the biggest weaknesses of this type of deck, is that if you don't get your Tunnelers, <laughs> you know, quick enough, you know, you, you can't really go too late with the deck. Depend on the version you're running, though. Like, Mentalist does help quite a lot. Um, you know, some people use Jags instead, or, or a combination of both. Uh, Jags being the card that increases your damage, doubles the damage. It's a 3 cost, so it fits in the same slot there. Uh, he inspires double damage. So, you know, makes it so Azure Fate does 4, this does 10, all that sort of good stuff. Um, but yeah, so this, again, based on the matter, is how you're going to, you know, you take your first deck, and then you're going to adjust it based on the matter. So, as I said, I took first Mono Sapphire, which then, you know, the meta then all became Mono Sapphire. So then to try beat my own deck, I did the, the Wild Sapphire version, which was beating it. I ended up losing to it in the semi-finals of uh, Five Shots Cup of Fate, Season 1. Yeah, Season 1, so I lost, I came third in that one. Losing with my deck that beats my deck, because I just, you know, you, you still have to get lucky. Um, but yeah, so I lost, um, but that, you know, that deck was designed to beat that one. And then this deck wasn't really designed to beat anything specific, but then, as I said, I didn't really use it in set 2. It became very good in set 3, though, because of, um, you know, the, the, the advantages of this deck um, is the fact that it's not committing troops to the board. They're all tunneling, and they all, like, this, for example, is a tunneling 3. The Reese, which is the main guy, is tunneling 4, with the Spy is tunneling 2. So if you get the right curve, you could have several tunnelers popping out of the ground at the same time, uh, and then you're doing all this explosive one turn a chunk of damage, playing her out at quick speed at the end of your opponent's turn. Maybe two of these pop out, like maybe Reese and Hypno pop out in the same turn, and then you've got you know nine damage just from those popping out. You've got you know Tetzot that you can create, and that the main reason why this then became popular was because. We had this new card introduced, which is that Crocosaur I mentioned earlier, that just really shut down troop-heavy decks. You know, we already had things in the meta like Extinction, which blows up all troops on both sides of the board. Uh, but this Croco here, just, you know, very good value. Um, but So you, you didn't want to try... You didn't want to go too crazy, committing lots of things to the board, as, you know, the meta wasn't... That's not... The meta was dictating that's a bad idea because of the cards that were available and the decks were being run. So then this deck obviously came in, you know, it's like, hey, this deck can actually do well. We've got answers to stop those pucks and periwinkles I showed you. Uh, you know, we've got things to stop Vampire Princess, which was another, you know, vampires of still, still to this day are very much in the meta. But we, you know, set three introduced the Vampire Princess. So that was another card that is a very, very much a threat that you, in most cases, cannot ignore. So, you know, you've got the answers with two of the cards in the meta. Time Ripple as well, and then again, you've got that explosive potential all in one turn to just win the game. So that, you know, that, again, that's why that then became a thing, pretty much. So, you know, again, all started from that one deck, pretty much back in set two with Mono Sapphire. Um, and then, yeah, ball from there. You take it, you take the meta into account, and see what you can do. So, uh, hopefully all that rambling, I, I need to actually take a drink. Hopefully all that rambling and madness made some sense there. Um, but, you know, again, like, do not do not be scared of deck building. Like, it's, it's, it may seem daunting at first, like, because there's, there's lots of cards, there's been loads of decks built, you might not know where to start, or what the hell you're doing, but just, just pick a card. Like, say, you, like I said before, if you, if you see something, like, you might be like, oh, Vampire King... That's sweet. I love this. This looks awesome. That has, I mean, it is a very powerful effect and one of the most expensive cards in the game for a reason, as the effect is very strong. So you might see something like this and go, okay, how can I, how can I build a deck? Like, if I stick to Mono Blood, what do I want to do to, you know, to just, you know, start from, get the starting point, and then you might be like, alright, well, let's get the princess. I don't know if it's his daughter or whatever, but let's get his daughter. 
and chuck her in the... Oh, I guess... I mean, I guess so, right? Because it's a princess. But uh, throw her in the deck as well, and then, you know, what... You know, just put in a whole bunch of good cards, you know. But then you might say, all right, but I want to I want to try and make a deck that utilizes this effect. I want to abuse this effect. I want to make sure I'm hitting troops. So, for example, you might get the Vampire King. Let me actually just go new deck here real quick. I'll just slap in a random name. So I might say, all right, this is my starting point for a deck. I want to now abuse this effect, which let me just quickly read out what it does. So when he deals damage to opposing champion, it will reveal a random card from your opponent's hand. If it's a troop, it then transforms into this little vampire here, which is a nice 2-2 flyer with life train. So not only are you removing a troop from your opponent's hand, so they're, you're getting advantage that way twice, because they're losing a card and you're gaining a troop. So you've gained a board state and they've lost a troop. So that's obviously very powerful. So if you want to abuse this effect, you might say, all right, uh, and this is something that was done back in set two, uh, you know, you might use Time Ripple, which, as you, as we saw before, it's something that can put a troops, a target card. Now, this is something that can be used on not just troops, and that's where Time Ripple it can be nice, is it's flexible. You can use it to bounce back a constant, an artifact, whatever it may be. Uh, but, you know, let's say we put a troop back in their opponent's hand, and they've got nothing else in hand, and then we swing in with the Vampire King, well, we've just gained a troop. We've got, we've permanently dealt with the troop now, you know, and it's now mine as a vampire. Also, we can utilize Buccaneer, which does much of the same. You know, it's again a sending a troop back to your opponent's hand. So, you know, that, that could be your starting point. You're like, you know, I, I want to abuse this. So you've done that. And then maybe you're like, all right, well, let's, let's also do another, you know, nice blood card, which is Inquisition. Uh, so we get to look at your opponent's hand, and then maybe you remove non-troops from their hand. So you're like, all right, let's get rid of that action. Or, you know, maybe they've got removal. So you remove that from their hand on turn two. Maybe on turn three, you bounce a troop of theirs. Turn four, you get your Vampire King down. Maybe they play out a big flyer, or they get a free Angel of Dawn, which I'll quickly show you what Angel of Dawn is. Another card in the meta. Um, just a, you know, very big flying angel here, Avatar of Hope. It's a flying steadfast, so it can beat you down while also defending, because it's steadfast means it can attack uh, without exhausting. So, you know, let's say your opponent got that after you've played your Vampire King. Maybe you then time ripple it, and then you're lucky enough to then hit that with the Vampire King. It's the random card that's revealed. You've now permanently dealt with the Angel, as it's now got turned into a Vampire, and it's now joined your side of the field to beat down your opponent as a 2-2. So, you know, that, that there is just a simple... A simple th point, you know, you might want to, again, use that effect, you know, how can we, you know, what cards can we utilize to to make a greater use of the, the effect to get it more consistently, um, while also making these cards more powerful in themselves, as, you know, they're, they're very good for tempo, but by then also increasing the odds of hitting those troops, you, you've, you've made them more powerful, you've got some synergy going. So that might be your starting point. And you might do the same with, you know, here's a card that was introduced in set 3. Uh, the Angel of Judgment here, which is actually, I believe it's a, um, yeah, this is the uh, vanity card for for a chap named Stoked. Also mentions his name here in the flavor text. But, uh, yeah, it's a vanity card. I don't know, I don't, I don't think he's got this, like, weird glowy effect on his chest in real life, though, or the eyes. But yeah, so this is a, a card that you might say, you know, I really like this card. Or maybe you're, you know, maybe Stoked himself was like, you know what, I have to use my own card. So he wants to now build the deck. And doesn't have to, you know, again, you don't have to be always trying to make a deck that's going to take down the meta. You could just be wanting to have some fun. And fun is great. So you might take this card and say, all right, when another card you control enters a crypt from, each play, from, from play, each opposing champion sacrifices a card. You might be like, oh... That sounds very interesting. So, how can I abuse that card? You know, what can I do that synergizes with this card? And that's your starting point. So, you know, here's your starting point for a good deck. You're like, alright, let's put three of those in a deck. Alright, so we need to have stuff of mine dying to then kill your opponent's stuff. So you might be like, alright, well, there's a card that I know of. I remember a card from back in the day. And you might be like, alright, well, I can use this to sacrifice my own troops. And so if I've got the, you know, I can use this not only to potentially get this into play earlier but I, I could also use it to then sacrifice needless troops you know maybe I've, maybe I'm using a bunch of bunnies or just whatever the hell it may be 
and you're using them and then you know once once you've got that angel in play you can then sacrifice you know whatever so then you're like okay so we need some troops now to sacrifice so for example you might go all right well a good troop that's pretty sweet that works with hideous conversion is Shroomshaw and I'll explain why let me actually put the hideous conversion in here so here's a good starting point right you might be like all right we want the conversion so that's going to give us a resource for the turn every time we sacrifice a troop so if we can put down something that like this here is a two drop one a two drop one one that when it dies it creates two battle hoppers now that's the key thing here is that it'll die and then create two of these little poopy bunnies right so you're basically getting three troops for one there so that's three resources you can gain with this so let's say you're on turn four or no turn three sorry let's say you're on turn three you've got these on the board you've got this in hand you can now sacrifice all three of those the shroom shore itself the two battle hoppers and play out your angel of judgment here on turn four then depending on your hand you might then uh, play out another shroom shore for example sacrifice and all of a sudden you've made your opponent lose three of their troops in play uh, so then you're like alright what else can we use to make sure we've got enough things to play uh, there's a card that was introduced in set three if I can remember the name uh, not the name is escaping me someone in chat might say it, but I'll probably find it before they do it's basically a card advantage card based on how many troops that sacrificed in the turn so um, it's a blood card if I can remember the name it's a three cost let's find the damn bugger uh, and I can breathe <laughs> Uh, I may have went past him. Uh, I'm sure Malikus is going to say it before I find it. Ah, uh, oh, there it is. Found it. Harvest of Sorrow. So this is a card you can utilize. So again, you know, uh, draw a card for each troop that's died the turn. So you can make sure you've... Not only are you gaining resources for sacrificing them, you can then... Uh, uh, you know, draw draw more cards, which is obviously great. You know, again, card advantage is king. So, uh, you know, that's again. So we've got some stuff that's synergized together there. And just for a bit of fun here, let's actually show a deck that utilizes some of those. I just remembered I have one built. At least I should have. Oh, you did? Well, no, you, you technically you said it like, anyway, stream delay. <laughs> So here's a deck that actually utilizes some of those things here. It's a lot of fun, not very competitive, um, but if you do get the combo early enough, you can just go bonkers insane. Uh, if you want to see this in action, you can actually check on my YouTube uh, in my YouTube videos. There was a video where I did uh, a uh, challenger champion thing where I had people versing Coma, who was the winner of the 40k Invitational, and he uh, he was on the stream. And uh, he was challenging people from chat, and he used uh, a similar version of this deck here. Um, I, I went ahead and changed it to my liking. <laughs> changed a few things. But it's basically the same as what he was running. Uh, but it's a basically just a huge combo deck that utilizes, you know, you've got loads of cheap, you know, free, you got free rabbits everywhere. All these battle hoppers you can make. Rabbits everywhere. you got this to make it so you're getting even more rabbits. Um... So this, you know, makes a lot of sh lot of shin hair every all over the place. Shin hair everywhere. They're all useless. They all do nothing. <laughs> There's nothing in the deck to make it so that they're, they're, the rabbits are going to kill your opponent. But the whole idea was to just get loads of rabbits, sacrifice them, then you can uh, draw loads of cards with this, then potentially play even more rabbits, even more and more, and then draw. Then, for example, you could do this again in the same turn to draw, draw even more cards because it's going to stack because it's all based on the same turn. And then you just, just oh, you, then you've got like 20 resources and then just life slap into the face. <laughs> it's a very fun deck. Uh, again, not it, there's many ways to interrupt it. It's very, you know, if you don't get like hideous conversion, you're not going to do anything. Uh, but once you get that combo, like you, you, if you're watching this, be it via stream right now, or via YouTube, take a screenshot, have some fun with this. It definitely is a fun combo. Just to, you just got to do it at least once. Uh, but it's all about just you know this. You get this down early. Start putting rabbits out everywhere, and then once you get those key cards, be it conversion and harvest. Sorry, you just need one of each of those. 
once you've got that, you, it just goes mental. You you then just like, oh, it just it absolutely goes nuts. And then all of a sudden, you've done a life siphon for fatal, and that's the only thing you casted the whole game that did damage, <laughs> and you just win. Very fun. I added in a withering touch because that way I can try and make sure my opponent doesn't have like a counter magic or something before you do the life siphon. Uh, but yeah, so that that there, you know, again, if you'd like to try that, take a screenshot, have some fun. Um, so I'm just going to quickly read chat here. Uh, if you want to do the numbers, you just do like the left bracket number and then the, the right bracket. So it's basically the same, just do a number. Um, yeah. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Just don't draw too many cards? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's where this can help. Another fun thing you can do with this card is after you've sacrificed all the bunnies, uh, you can, you know, before you're about to draw a bunch of cards, you can put them back in your own deck if you like. But another fun thing you can do is just be like, you know what? I'm going to give my opponent's deck 40 useless battle hoppers. <laughs> Definitely fun thing to do. So, you know, feel free to try that as an achievement as well. See how many battle hoppers you can put in your opponent's in your opponent's deck. But uh, definitely, definitely very fun. Um, just, uh, I mean, if you're meaning, like, if you're meaning like this, how I've got number one there, like, I don't know if that's what you're meaning there, but, um, basically you just do like that, but I, I, I don't know if that's what you mean. <laughs> Let me read it again. So, what did he say? Uh... Yeah, no, I think I think that's what debug was referring to. So yeah, hopefully that there has gave you guys some, you know, I mean, I obviously I talked for way too long there, but uh, you know, again, uh, when it comes to deck building, it's really not, it's not something you should be feel like it's it's way too daunting or it's you know like ah oh, I don't know where to start. Just pick, find a card that, you know, maybe maybe you go watch a video on YouTube of someone. Maybe in the future I'll have a video. Like I, I plan to do card evaluations for set 4 when it's released so maybe you check that out on my YouTube in the future and you can then find out what's actually you know what what's a good card you know what's something that you know is this card I like the look of actually good is it worthwhile in the matter if you're just playing a fun deck well then it doesn't matter but you know find a card that you want to as your starting point that's definitely the easiest way to build a deck is to find that starting point what's that one card that you want to or maybe it's not just one card, but maybe you've got two cards that you really want to use. So find your starting point, and then build from there. And and then from testing, from playing the deck, you might be like, alright, that was garbage. I'm going to take this card out, and I need... Uh, I'm lacking, you know, I'm lacking this, so let's bring in this card, and, you know, try out different things, experiment, but, you know, that's that's basically, um, you know, should help you in, in deck building, basically, if you've... If you've met, if you've listened to all that garbage I just spewed out of my mouth, hopefully it'll help you, and you'll be able to start building awesome decks as well. Um, so again, I'll just go back to my little PowerPoint slidey slidey real quick. Give me just a second. So just a reminder here. Um, you know, you've got the the deck size. Stick to 40 cards in limited, 60 cards in constructed. Uh, that includes your resources. Um, you know, don't don't go over that. So if you're building a constructed deck, stick to 60, limited 40, and then also with your resources, you know, 40% as your base. So if you're building a constructed deck, you're going to want 24 resources as your base. Maybe that's your starting point. Maybe uh, you know, again, if you're new to the game and you're not sure, you know, what what sort of curve should be using. Um, you know more than this, or what should occur, should be using less. One way you could test that is, uh, you know, you've got the test draw mechanic in the card manager itself, which I'll bring back up in a second. But also just testing the deck. You know, maybe you start at 24, you play the deck, and you're like, you know what, I'm getting resource staff too much. Maybe you then put in another one, test it out some more, and see how you go. And then, as I said here, with the aggressive decks. Uh, that are using uh, 30 to 35 percent. That's generally for constructed, as you're able to build the deck as you want it. Uh, in limited, you're probably going to still want to stick to that 40 percent. Uh, maybe you go down a shard, depending on your curve. Always your curve will should dictate your your shard, uh, your the amount of resources you're running. Um, 
so that was just a quick reminder there. So um, let me go back over to here and just show you what I meant about the the test draw mechanic here. So you can use this and go, all right, you know, how is the how is it looking? You know, how many hands would be playable? You could you could do that if you like and just keep looking. You know, just like is the resource base good enough? You know, in this case, using forty percent for this deck. Uh, and the reason being, you know, it's while it does have some high cost stuff here, you know, quite a few. The reason why this deck can get away with running uh, only forty percent, whereas traditionally, if these were, you know, if this was, you know, if this deck was just uh, didn't have the the things I'm about to explain, you know, you would have to run more really because you've got a lot of high cost stuff. And the reason why it can get away with it is because it uses chlorophyllia, which is a ramp card. So you know, you're able to play this on two and get another resource but also you're using Puck now. Puck is the main thing here very very powerful and uh, you know you can gain a, a temporary resource for the turn for each troop in your hand with cost 5 or greater so he's like super ramped so if he doesn't die and you've got all these fatties in your hand you potentially can play on turn 3 you know if you're lucky you use you could play a root father here which is a very powerful card in the meta uh, very powerful you know another socketable card but we've also got Cressida which is another champion that for three and a ruby wild threshold you can give yourself one temporary resource for the turn so you've got that that insurance there you've got a little bit of ramp so you've got ways with those three things there to make sure you're uh, you know you're able to play what you need to play also root father has a very sweet effect which makes it so you can pay two to put him from your hand into your deck and draw a card it also decreases his cost by two, and I know it's very hard to read that, but uh, you know it just means that so if you if you've got a hand that is slow and you didn't get enough ramp or your puck died, uh, you can actually cycle this and try get more resources from your deck. As there, you can read the text a bit easier there from the tooltip. As it says, you can put it from your hand into your deck, gets minus cost, and you draw a card, so you replace it. So you're like, all right, I can't play this. I'm not going to be able to play it for like five more turns or three more turns. I'm going to get rid of it and try to get a resource or something I can play. So that's why this type of deck here can get away with that. Uh, let me see if I have... Um, I don't think I... I think I've deleted most of my aggro decks, to be honest. <laughs> actually, I mean, I've got this one here, I guess. Which is actually just a flube deck. Ah, but it's, it's running what? I mean, that's actually... Yeah, so this here... It's not, you know, this is not a real deck or anything. It was something I was stuffing around with, I guess. But as you can see here, it's running 30%. As the highest cost card is is this guy here, which is, you know, three cost. And then everything else is two or lower. And you can, you know, you can still, you're going to have times where, like this here is a good hand. You've got the Ashwood Soloist, which when it, when it attacks, you gain a temporary resource. Uh, but this hand is actually pretty damn sweet. Uh, so, you know, that's great. This is risky, and would have probably not done enough. The soloist would help. Uh, the resource comes a bit later. Another one there that also, you know, maybe the deck shouldn't run vortex because there are things that are double. That uh, you know, you're still like even with as you can see at 30%, it only needs to really get two. Like this hand here, for example, you've got. A one drop you can play, and then Anarchist will draw you more cards provided it hits in. Um, but yeah, it, it is a gamble, no matter how you look at it, it's still a gamble. But as you can see, you've also got over here a stack view, so you can actually see your curve. So this is a good thing to utilize when you want to see, you know, what's my curve actually look like. So you can see here, it's all basically one drops, <laughs> a bunch of twos, and then just one three. Now this. Again, it's not a real deck or anything, just not a real deck, it's uh, just something I was stuffing around with just to experiment with, uh, you know, because Ashwood Soloist, um, you know, enables you to play a 3-drop on 2, and Yancey is a nice thing to play on 2, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's, it's just, you know, so you can get away with that sort of stuff if your deck is built to, to survive on 1 or 2 shards, uh, you can get away with that, you can risk it if it's worth it, you know, risk versus reward, right? Um, but yeah, in limited, you're not going to be able to, you know, you're not going to get this many one drops, this many two drops in limited, even if, I mean, you could, but there'll probably be a lot of garbage in there. <laughs> it's not worth doing. Uh, so, you know, 
uh, you know, again, so you'll be you'll be doing more than 30% in limited. So anyway, um, let me quickly check the chat here. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's the, as I said, it's not a real deck. But uh, you get the idea of what I'm explaining there. So, um, and yeah, let me actually quickly go back to a different deck. Do, 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 do. So let's go to, here's a deck that I've been having a lot of fun with lately. And again, you get to see in this view, you get to see the curve. So you can see that there's a lot of, a decent amount of ones. You know, it's the majority of the deck is ones. Uh, and then the second highest is two. Then, you know, third is three. And then, you know, as you get higher and higher into the costs of cards, it, you know, you want to have less, in, in, you know, in, in this case. And I'm running, in, the, in this version, 37, so 22 shards. Uh, and the reason for that is we've got Thunderfield Seer, which is a one drop that... Um, when you play it, the next action in your deck gets to draw a card, so you get to replace it, so you get that, you know, basically you've got that ways to, to draw more cards, so therefore you're, you're, you're likely to get to more shards, but Arcane Focus, again, being that amazing one drop that can help you ensure the, the, the resources. Um, one thing, well, I was running, see, this is a deck that I keep going back and forth on in, in 22, 23 shards, is because a lot of the times I, I lose because I'm flooding, so I thought, you know what, I'll just go back and put a peek in. Uh, so that's what I've done lately, is just put another peek back in there. But lots of ways to draw cards. We've got Oracle Song. Uh, so the deck can easily, you know, if it gets to three, you're, you're going to be fine. You don't even need more than that. Um, I mean, obviously, you're going to want to. Like, this gets reduced in cost as you play actions. So it's never really, you're never really casting it for six, unless you are flooding out. And it's just like, well, I don't, I don't have anything to cast. I'm at seven resources or six. So you play it, but... Uh, you know, it, it gets by, you know, get to four and you don't really need to get to more um, for this style of deck. So it can get away with doing a little bit less. But you're still going to have those times where, you know, you get a hand like this and it's like, well, it's super risky. So then you risk it and you get flubed. <laughs> in this case, mm, I mean, you could do four Thunderfield Sears in a row. <laughs> but uh, like this hand here, too many shards even. Um, yeah, that, that's actually a bit too many shards for that one. Uh, this hand is actually, again, it's a lot of shards, right, for opening hand. Ideal amount is three, for probably any deck, really. Uh, three is a nice amount. Well, aggro decks, you probably want two. Uh, but this deck, you know, you got combo here. Uh, this is one of the sweetest combos in the deck. The Thunderfield Seer, if you play this now, with this sort of hand, I would not play this on turn one. Because the whole idea of these guys together, they're, they're the Thunderfield team, they're the... They're the Thunderfield duo that work very nicely together. Now again, so this is, it gives the prophecy effect, which is draw a card, so your next action. And then you got the Elder over here that uh, does a prophecy effect also, which is on your next action when you play this copy it. So now you can see the synergy there immediately that, uh, you know, in this case, I would play on turn two. Now you don't play this on one because you want to maximize the chance of drawing that action with this effect on it, because you're going to be playing this on three. So what you do is you play out your jewel shard, grab a sapphire in this case, because you've then got all your thresholds met. You then play out these on turn two, so both of them on turn two. Then let's so let's see what would we have drawn. So that we would have already gotten. Um, so let's see. So turn one we play a shard. Depends on if we're on the draw and the play, but let's just for example say that we got these on two. Played this on three, and then we drew the Oracle Song or whatever. This would then have Target Champion draws the two cards, draw a card when it's played, draw a card when it's played, and when it's played, copy it. Now that is actually too many cards, <laughs> but it just shows you the synergy there and the power. Like that would actually be rather crazy. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually be happy about hitting that too much. It'd still be sweet. But you would draw too many cards right there with if that all went onto the Oracle Song. The whole the the ideal thing to hit is things like Rage Fire, or even just a Crackling Bolt, uh, for this deck. But uh, you know, again, if you want to actually check out this deck and see it in action and me talking about it more, uh, this Thunder the Thunderstruck deck, uh, episode eight, the last episode I did of Monday Men of Madness, which is also on my YouTube, uh, goes over this deck. But uh, yeah, so. Anyway, so I'm going to it, but uh, yeah. So again, you got your champions here, all that sort of stuff. You know, this deck actually, I used to run a champion called Benvolio. 
So this one here, uh, the reason for running this champion is it enables you to potentially play Sun Soul Phoenix earlier, as it's a troop that gets reduced in cost for each action you've played. So Savas combos with that nicely. And Benvolio is something I used to run when I didn't run Phoenix, uh, which is just a four cost draw card. So you got, you know, again, when it comes to deck building, you've got many options when it comes to your champions. And then, you know, obviously, you know, you, you might start from a mono blood deck, or in the example I used today, you start from that mono sapphire. You want that really consistent deck, so you start from there. And then, as the meta evolves, you, you know, okay, I'm going to splash this color for that. Okay, the meta evolves again. Let's, you know, now we've got a whole new set. Now all that deck I made back here, we can now do a ruby sapphire. Or maybe you then do a, uh, you know, a diamond sapphire. You know, there's, there's many ways to go, but, uh, you know, you got to start somewhere. So as I said, you know, if you're just getting into the into hex, and you want to build a deck, um, you know, maybe maybe you've uh, bought a bunch of packs and you've cracked them, and or you just want to start, uh, you know, you could go to things like hexmeta.com and look at what's being run in the meta, what's been winning. Uh, you could then be like, all right, I like the look of that deck, but I want to I want to put my own twist on it. Or again, you know, a good place to start, you know, once you do have a lot of cards, is just to be like. You know, if if you want to like, um, you know, make something your, of your own and try and define the meta yourself. I mean, you know, maybe set four hits, so everything is everyone's going to start again in a way. So maybe set four is just hit. Everyone's opening packs and cards of trading all over the place, and you're like, all right, this set four card looks super sweet. I'm going to grab this one. You know, let's pretend this is a set four card. <laughs> bad one to use. This is a really bad card. But uh, let's just say, you know, the some set four card really catches your eye. You know, put it in your deck and then build from there. You know, you can actually go up to here. So say you don't have all the cards, but you've got a bunch of set four ones. You might then go, all right, I don't want PVE cards. I want to play constructed. I want to see PVP cards, and I'm going to click show all items. So if you are a new player, you've only got set four cards, and if you hit that, you'll then see all the cards. It'll show which ones you don't have, and what you can do is basically plan out what you're going to build. So you can build your deck. I don't actually think you can add the cards if you don't have them, but you can you know, work out what you need. And then from there, you can go visit the auction house and uh, buy, buy what's necessary and then build that deck that you have the idea for. And uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so, and yeah, as people are saying in the chat here, uh, Mono Diamond is, is uh, I, I do feel, I agree, Mono Diamond is going to be a thing uh, in set 4. We've seen cards like William Rowan. We've seen, uh, you know, we've already got Valiant Escort. We're going to see, uh, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot of good, uh, a lot of good, uh, we just saw a new shifter today, a 4-drop Legendary Diamond card for Necrotic. That's going to work very well with, uh, actually, I'll bring it up on screen real quick here, for those of you who haven't seen it yet. So bear with me just a moment. I'll show this Legendary real quick. If I can find the flubes, did I save it? No, I didn't. I apologize. It's on Reddit. It's on. If you go to reddit.com slash uh, reddit.com slash r slash hextcg, uh, there is actually a, a picture of the card. It's called the uh, High Infinitrix or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but it's a very nice necrotic shift card, legendary, that will combo very nicely with an aggressive potentially mono diamond aggressive deck but also using uh, sub spy uh, as well I uh, not sub spy um, I don't know why I said sub spy um, I'll show you the one I mean so whoops we have to bring up diamond here so sub spy uh, spirit band spy is what I meant to say uh, so you know it's a necrotic so let me let me quickly grab the image here it'll be easier <laughs> so I'm gonna go to reddit myself And uh, just quickly save the image which I I have put on there. So save image, put it on my drive, Steam Graphics folder. So let me quickly grab that. There it is. And let's grab it. So thanks for the link there, but I've I've got it now as well. Position. Why is it not working? Come on, hex. Well, not hex. I don't know why I said come on hex. It's to do with my computer. Um, position. Fit the screen. 
I didn't want it to actually fit the screen, but to get it to display, I had to do that. So now I'll reset the size. So we've got this here. It's the, yeah, high, high infinitrix. I, I don't know. I'm probably saying it right, but uh, saying it wrong. But uh, yeah, so that's the card there. Got revealed today from the General's Tent, which is uh, Function and uh, Mokog on the official stream. They do it every, I guess, what is it today? Today it's Thursday to me for Wednesday uh, for you Yankees. Um, <laughs> so they revealed this one today. It's a set uh, four card. And as you can see there, it has a very nice shift effects. But the, the reason why I say it works very well with the Spirit Bound Spy is because it says when you play a Necrotic, you may revert this. And the Spirit Bound Spy, as most of us will know, um, it is uh, very powerful with with very nice. You know, when you if you if it's a one, you know, if you've got this in play already, and you put things, you know, you can make it a, a bigger threat by giving it buffs and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then when it dies, it transforms into a phantom. So it becomes a flyer, but it, because it's transform, it'll keep all those buffs you've gave it. So very nice. But also you've got the fact that it's a one drop necrotic. So if you do play her first, um, say you've got her out in turn four, you then next turn you shift a bunch of stuff to something else. So let's say let's say we're using two spirit bound spies in this example. We play out as you know we've got the spirit bound spy on the board. We then give it flight. We then give it steadfast. We then give it life drain. Now that's actually not that great. You're going to want to also let's say we've abominate onto it earlier as well. So you've got this really nice flyer with steadfast and life drain now. Um, and then, you know, you can play out the other Spirit Bound Spy, revert her, and then you've got, you know, just, yeah, some you've used up probably your resources at that point, because it does cost one to shift. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, what's that there? This is also for more dance... Make... Yeah, no, that's uh, a good good card there. Uh, let me bring that up on the screen as well. Give me a second. Might as well show this one off as well. As it does, it does. You know, it is something that potentially will be uh, be used with this card, maybe. So let me bring that up. Uh, yeah, I think five is a bit much. I don't know if I would. I don't think I will. But uh, you know, this is the card here. So it's all it's all about phantoms. I think that's. Eh, you know, it definitely works with Deep Gaze Champion, right? Because Deep Gaze Champion is a card that every time you shift. You know, like it's <laughs> like I, it's it's you know I'll show DK's champion in a second, but again here's another set four card, so definitely uh you know you know since we've been talking about deck building now for two two hours and a bit, um, you know when set four does hit, look forward to lots of videos from me when it comes to deck building. Obviously I've got Monday Meta Madness which is going to go mental because uh, that's all about you know meta decks and all that sort of stuff. So, unfortunately, I will have to share my secrets with you guys, but I'll probably keep some secret tech to myself. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you've got all that sort of stuff to look forward to. Uh, but, yeah, let me show you the Deep Gaze Champion, which is a set three card. Um, and you see, seen some play, but uh, definitely, uh, you know, with that Infinitrix card we just saw, uh, this is very, 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 very powerful. As when you when a power is shifted, now we have to remember she's got three different shift effects on that card. So every time you shift, this guy just by sitting on the board buffs all your troops with plus one plus one. Very very powerful effect. Hell, there's even a champion here that that's what it does as its thing. Uh, Warmaster Fazuko here. Troops you control get plus one plus one. That costs five, five. So you know, just think about this for a second. It's like you're casting, you know, as long as you've got him on the board and you've got some some dudes, and you every time you shift, you're basically getting a free Warmaster buff, you know, the same effect, really, <laughs> every time. So very, very powerful. Uh, and, oh, that artwork is super, super sweet, is it not? Uh, you know what I just realized? He's got, like, this weird, like, hair thing going on here that actually reminds me of Hunter x Hunter. Uh, anybody who's seen that will know what I'm talking about. I've only just now saw that like I mean it's probably not you know it's not obviously the same thing but in Hunter x Hunter like if we had an extended 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 art version of this maybe that's going off into the sky <laughs> anybody again anybody who knows what I'm talking about there will know what I'm referring to uh, but everyone else is just like you idiot havoc so uh, yeah uh, very much lots to look forward to in uh, you know just next week next week guys next week 
Holy moly, I am excited. Uh, so yeah, holy moly. Uh, one thing before I um, wrap up this, you know, deck building tips, you know, me talking about deck building, obviously. Uh, before I wrap that up, uh, I will just have to say, I forgot what I had to say. <laughs> now, um, there was something I was going to link, something I was going to mention. Uh, you think his hair looks like Gon's? I mean, was it Gon? I don't, I don't know the kid's name anymore. But you know when he transforms into like an adult version of himself? And his hair's like flying off into this, like just, you know, crazy, crazy into the sky? Um, yeah, like you know what I'm talking about. It's kind of that same effect is what I'm talking about. Obviously, we don't know how high that's going. But anyway. Um, so what was I going to mention? Um, um, right, that's what I was going to mention. So if you're watching this on YouTube, which obviously most people who see this will be watching it via YouTube, if you have any questions relating to deck building or hex in general, uh, feel free to chuck those in the comments and I'll, I'll answer them ASAP. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you... If you uh, you know, if if uh, if this help video helped you at all when it comes to deck building, but you have some extra questions, uh, please do not hesitate to ask. I'll do my best to answer. Um, you mean against the cat? No, it happened like really near the end of the series. Um, I'm gonna have to find a picture now. Give me a second. You're gonna make me search for this. Gone transform. Let's see if that that's enough. So. I need to find a good picture. There's plenty of pictures. Alright, so... <laughs> There's some really funny pictures, too. Um, uh, I mean, there's some that show it, but I want to try to find one that shows it better. Eh. Just look up Gone Transform in, in Google. There you go, Malicus. <laughs> don't need to bring it up. So, uh... So maybe you didn't see it. I don't know. Well, you didn't see it. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I think that pretty much wraps up deck building. Again, don't don't get scared. Deck building is not something you should be scared of. Or, you know, it's... Yeah. It's just... Just start small and work your way from there. Um, just before he goes... Yeah, I mean, he basically almost kills himself, right? Um... And yeah, they need to like... Yeah, anyway. <laughs> That's anime. I'm a huge fan of anime, so if you, have, if you don't know that, well, I am. So if you'd like to also talk to me about anime, I'm always more than happy to talk about anime. But uh, yeah, that pretty much wraps up the deck building stuff. Uh, again, chuck comments in YouTube. Um, but I'll probably just stick around here on Twitch for a little bit longer. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I will do... Um... What? Ah, uh, spoiler? What's wrong? Oh! <laughs> Yuck! Oh no! Stop! Right, not everyone that's obviously seen the anime. Um, yeah, maybe you think... I, I mean, he did, he, but like... Yeah, alright, let's, let's shut up so we don't spoil it for Enigma. It's a good anime. Good anime. So what I'm going to do here real quick... I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to stick around. But I will bring up my my thingamajiggy here real quick uh, let's see, not that, not that, not that click, 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 click oh, I clicked too far, damn it <laughs> bear with me just a second alright, so I'm gonna just display hang on, Bella and I, long time no see buddy on pal, so again, I'm not, I'm not heading off yet but I'm gonna put this up here just so I can know where I have to end the highlight for YouTube so you know for those of you who are watching this stream you know the stream highlight on YouTube uh, you know thanks for watching obviously uh, again put your comments in the you know below um, you know ask questions all that sort of stuff you know if uh, you know if, if if I didn't cover everything and you're still confused about anything to do with deck building or hex in general Please comment, and I'll do my best to answer. But uh, for those of you in Twitch right now, uh, I'm not actually heading off just yet, so stick around. I'm just going to quickly go and get a drink, or fill up my drink as it's empty. So yeah, I'll be back in just a moment.
but that's you know again I just put that up just so I can it's easy to highlight the video I just need to find that image basically <laughs> so yeah I'll be back in just a moment